a little musical interlude here. Let's see here. Maybe I'll play the uh, glockenspiel to let people know exactly what we're doing here. Uh, their sound effects should be coming on. We're talking with Heino Falka. Here we go. That beautiful intro music written by one of my good friends, Miguel Tully, <clears throat> a.k.a. Yeti okay. Tears, who provides a lot. I'll play the glockenspiel. There's a glockenspiel. I don't know exactly what a glockenspiel should sound like, but I know you could tell me if that's actually correct. We'll wait for people to find it. Yeah, it's a glockenspiel. It's when you have bells, you know, it's lots of bells. So. Lots of bells, tinkling bells away. Excellent. Right. All right, we got a bunch of people coming in. We're going to have a great time today talking with one of the, uh, the leaders working on the cutting edge the cutting edge of, uh, of shadows of space-time itself. And that is, uh, that is Heino Falka, who is joining us today from the lower regions, <clears throat> the Netherlands, uh, where he is a professor at Radboud, Radboud, Radboud University at Nijmegen. Radboud, Radboud, yeah. Radboud, okay, so some things that the, the Ds are hard. Um, and we're going to talk about the Event Horizon Telescope, because uh, I know, I think it is uh, it is un unequivocal that you were one of the first originators of these terms that we search for: the shadows of black holes, the event horizon that we're looking for that we have found that you your team has found in 2019 when you made this wonderful press conference release, uh, which later resulted in um, in many uh, well deserved accolades. And, uh, and and awards all over the all over the world. You are currently, as I say, a German professor of astroparticle physics and radio astronomy. You won the 2011 Spinoza Prize, as well as the 2006 Academy Prize of the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Sciences and Humanities. ERC grant uh, was uh, <clears throat> originated by you uh, for uh, some of this organizational, um, you know, the founding of this project and other projects to test. Einstein's theory of relativity. And for a long time, I have to commend you because I thought you guys would study Sagittarius A star. I thought that was going to be your uh, first target. But instead, you turned to Messier 87. And I want to talk about why that choice was made and what the announcement that was made just yesterday implies for astronomy, for cosmology, for physics. Uh, but first of all, can you tell us a little bit about the Event Horizon Telescope and what its mission is to do? Yeah, I mean, today this is a, um, a big collaboration of uh, 350 scientists around the world. It was founded by 13 stakeholder institutions, uh, among, among them was you know, my university, but you know, other places like Harvard, MIT, uh, Max Planck and Bonn, uh, institutions in Asia. Um, and... Uh, we try to image black holes. We try to see them. And that was my long-term dream, actually, to finally see a black hole. Um, it started all for me 25 years ago when I was uh, indeed looking at the black hole in the center of our Milky Way. And uh, I realized that um, you know, there's light coming directly from the event horizon, radio light, at a particular frequency. And that was what our models were, were, were telling me. Uh, and then, uh, you know, people in Bonn were working at this technology, very long baseline interferometry, which, you know, turns the entire Earth into a telescope. And, um, and, and then at some point, I, you know, I, I found some old books about, you know, relativity, which described how a black hole, you know, would, would bend light. And, and if, in fact, you know, it amplifies itself. And, um, and so what that means is, that the dark region, the event horizon, would become actually larger than I had actually thought before. And it would be shined, you know, and our models would tell us you would shine light at it uh, from all directions. Um, and, you know, with that magnific self-magnification of black holes, this, you know, what we then later called in this publication in 2000, this shadow of a black hole would possibly be observable by uh, a, a worldwide global telescope operating at the highest radio frequency, something that was just in the infancy at the time. But that was such a, a tantalizing uh, realization that um, 
you know, we, we, we could be see, looking into the darkness uh, of black holes and actually resolve that scale, see, you know, see almost down to the event horizon where, you know, all light disappears, where information disappears. Um, and, and from then on, we started, you know, working on it. I started working on it, doing a bit more theory, some observations. Um, and then uh, we published this paper in 2000. And then uh, in, uh, colleagues in the US started to do more experiments, a group of, of Dolman uh, developing broadband digital equipment. And in, uh, in the 2010s, 11, 12, we, you know, we thought we'd ha all have to work together to make this happen. Uh, there's only one world. And it doesn't belong to just one institution. You have to work together, and uh, if you want it or not, you know, um, <laughs> you you have you you if if you want to see black holes, you need the entire world, and uh, and out of that came the Event Horizon Telescope, which is, uh, you know, was was a was a rocky start at the beginning, and and now is is really you know gets going and 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 and, uh, and, and pushing through uh, the data and and the science where the stakes are very high and you have to be very careful mm -hmm. uh, what we do and so that sometimes it takes a long time so it's still not that you pick a call and you publish it no uh, it, uh, it takes not much longer um, yeah. I want to talk as much about the team and how we uh, how we come to understand the uh, <clears throat> the nature of large collaborations. I think is very mystifying to most scientists, uh, non scientists rather, and even to some scientists. You know, we're used to thinking of uh, scientists. The lay people might look at a scientist and say, "Oh, that's, they're very specialized. You know, I don't have any right to uh, to uh, learn about what they're doing because." You know, I wouldn't go into a doctor's office and, and just start, you know, messing around with the x-ray machine or something like that. And that's a specialized piece of equipment. And this is a specialized piece of equipment. But, um, but I think these types of things that you study are really uh, captivating of the whole world, as, as was shown many, uh, you know, just a few years ago. And yet, I think the public thinks about scientists as all just one big family working happily together. But I see it sometimes you have to combine almost rival teams, as, as you mentioned, uh, in order to use the resources that are necessary. These telescopes in your array, if I'm not mistaken, include telescopes at the South Pole in Chile, uh, Europe, everywhere across the planet. So it took a planet-sized telescope to do the work that you did. Talk about what, what is harder, measuring the, the event horizon, uh, <laughs> capturing the light shadow, or assembling a team of hundreds of scientists around the world to get them all working together on a common goal? I, I think the latter. Certainly, for most of scientists, um, we are used to sit behind the computer, do our stuff, sit behind the equipment, make it work, work overtime, uh, make sure you know we 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 get the results we have and overcome obstacles. But then they're always you know annoying uh, other people, right? You have to work with. They always have different opinions, um, and and usually you write your own papers, and then you know you, you disagree, and you go to conferences, and then you you discuss things, but you do your own thing. Now here you have to agree on what to do, how to do it, and um, and, and how to publish it, and you ch have to check I each other. Mm. But you know what is a, a challenge, sometimes a, a sociological challenge to to uh, egos and individualists as, as scientists is also a strength in the end, um, because we only have one world. We can do this experiment only once. Um, we. Um, we need to make sure we, we, we check ourselves. Hmm. So uh, usually, you know, if, if you're on your own, you publish a paper, someone else comes, oh, that's all crap, I have a better idea. And then let's stand next to each other. And it takes a long time until you, you know, the community accepts what is correct and who did, uh, who did proper data reduction, who did proper analysis, who had the right models and, and, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, here, you know, as I said, we need the entire world. Uh, we only have one group publishing this. So that competition, that checks and balances, you have to build into the collaboration. It cannot be a monolithic one thing, which is just, you know, one, you know, uh, ruled by one person. And then, uh, you know, that's what we do. We have multiple groups. 
and 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 it became sort of a, a mantra that almost everything we do we do at least twice or three times and and now i learned a new word quintuply uh quintru that's five times um uh, so in the latest paper where we published this po uh, polarization you know which tells of magnetic fields around the event horizon uh, there were five independent teams and methods that all agreed with each other wow. and 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 you know, talk to the coordinators and uh, that's a, a stressful process but i think it's a if you then look back at the outcome yeah and, and you see what has all been done because People are pushing each other. They are, you know, they say, you know, I've done it this way. You know, we we, we need to do this check. We cannot be entirely sure. We have to rerun this. Uh, um, it, it, the, the final outcome is is really impressive. Uh, yeah. I think what you know what you achieve together um, in what I call um, competitive collaboration. Um, is is so much better than what any individual can achieve. Yeah. It still needs the, the vision and ideas of individuals and also the egos, um, but it, uh, it it is you know this is nothing you can do on your own. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question from a good friend of the show, Ernesto Eduardo uh, Dubar Genes, I think is how I pronounce uh, Ernesto's last name. He's asking, uh, would a gravitational wave distort the geometry of the event horizon? Or not even um, would it even affect anything inside or outside the event horizon? Can gravitational waves uh, from the black hole? First of all, do they? Does this black hole emit gravitational waves? And then can they uh, perturb either inside or outside of the event horizon? Yeah, uh, that's a great uh, question. Uh, luckily, at this point, gravitational waves do not play. An important role for these black holes because they isolate; they're on their own. They're they're sleepy, so to speak. Yeah, they're they're not bothered by by anyone else. Um, rotation waves are created if you have two black holes merge, or if you have something really you know sizable object fall into uh, the uh, the supermassive black hole. Uh, then you disturb uh, space time, and uh, you radiate gravitational waves, and it actually does affect uh, they affect each other. Uh, they affect each orbit, and they affect their um, even their metric, uh, to, so the space time around them. So um, we have a very stable environment. The metric is the same today, tomorrow, and in the future, in the next hundred thousand years, the, the the space time curvature of M87 will not change at all. And that's a big strength compared to the gravitational wave measurements that that you know. Um, because there you have, you know, two black holes merge and it goes very quick and there's just bang. Um, and you hadn't seen them before. You see the gravitational waves and you have to infer all the infer all the parameters and then they're gone. You can't, you know, verify this anymore. Uh, you can, you know, you have lots of information from, from the data. Uh, we at least can go back and, and we have fewer sources. We have much fewer sources, but these few sources we can check over and over again. In fact, over the next 100 years, people can verify what we've done on this source. It will still be around. Uh, you can measure its mass better and better. Uh, so that's a, a big advantage. So you have fewer, but you can do them much better. Um, and, uh, and then you're testing really different aspects of gravity to mm. some degree. You know, in one case, you're testing the dynamics, and we are testing the space-time geometry, space-time curvature. Right. That's what we're measuring. <clears throat> Another good friend of the show, reminder, talking to Heino Falka of Rad uh, Bode University uh, in the Netherlands, talking about the event horizons, uh, really monumental discovery announcement yesterday. We'll get to why that's so important in just a bit. Just a reminder, please subscribe to this channel and hit the subscribe button and you'll be notified. We have a lot of live streams coming up. We have David Spurgle coming up very soon uh, and we're going to have John Mather, winner of the 2006 Nobel Prize on. Don't want to miss these conversations and uh, leave a comment and a thumbs up and follow uh, Heino on Twitter. His handle is hfalka at, uh, uh, over there on Twitter. So a question from Sebastian Clark, can a black hole diffract gravitational waves, can it act as a gravitational lens or even absorb the energy from a, a gravitational wave? That's a good question. I'm not the main expert really on, on general relativity, but I think that it, that is the case. Um, because you have gravitational waves, uh, you know they deform space-time, and if you if you run through gravitational, you know, 
the, the only the only object that really in the, in a major way changed space time is is um, our 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 black holes. I mean, Earth as well. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's it's a minor change, uh, and gravitational waves to some degree behave like light, um, and and light is is is, is being deflected uh, uh, around uh, black holes, and uh, in in fact, if you calculate gravitational waves that are being emitted. From this this merging process, you, you're really making you know um, uh, the same kind of calculations to some degree as you would do for light. You know, gravitational waves are um, even 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 emitted at the same radius. Um, you know, if, if you see that ring of light uh, uh, that we see in in M87, mm -hmm. this comes from light going around the circle more or less uh, uh, around the black hole. You know, light is almost 100% bent. And uh, the emission uh, of gravitational waves happens at exactly the same scale. This is where the gravitational waves are, you know, uh, produced, you know, and, and, and released. So we are really probing the same kind of physics uh, and the same kind of scale, spatial scale, as in, uh, in, in uh, with light and with gravitational waves. And we're really probing even the same aspect of the metric you know there's there you know there's a, you know, this, this, this space metric is um, space time metric is described by various components there's a time light me metric and that's directly related to the size of that ring and to the emission region of gravitational waves so really there are lots of similarities even though they are completely different techniques to some degree it, it just the difference is one is dynamic and the other one is, is, is static ah. <clears throat> Very good. And one is light, and the other one is space time. <laughs> space time light. <laughs> is, that a, is that a word that we can invent? <laughs> so let's talk about the telescope itself. Uh, can you give an overview? It's a worldwide telescope. It has it's a radio telescope, which means it operates uh, primarily at uh, at millimeter free wavelengths and below, and above. Uh, but can you say more about what are the primary components of it? And uh, and was this detection yesterday, this announcement yesterday, was this always in the planning? Or were you guys um, kind of surprised by it or serendipitously found the magnetic fields were were um, were robust enough to detect and actually do scientific, uh, make scientific measurements with? Yeah. Yeah, we're using radio, tel it's actually, radio telescopes. It's actually a network. Uh, so the telescope is a network of, of, of telescopes. So it's a, a telescope of telescopes. Um, a very hierarchical uh, structure, so to speak, um, and uh, you know we have, as you, I think you mentioned that before, we we used to have eight telescopes on six different locations. Among that, this really giant Alma telescope. It's a billion dollar, billion euro um, uh, 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 telescope, which in itself consists of smaller telescopes. Yeah, <laughs> so <laughs> you have Alma, which has I think sixty four dishes which are combined into one telescope and then that telescope is combined with all the other uh, seven telescopes into a worldwide telescope so really you're building up that uh, uh, that, that that structure from from uh, from few telescopes to more to e even more telescopes um, and uh, and you have a telescope in the south pole a 10 meter telescope that's a small telescope but you know the south pole is a very dry and cold region um, and uh, millimeter waves that we observe are actually affected by the humidity in the air. So you want to go to a high mountain where it's really dry, and South Pole is actually uh, perfectly uh, uh, suited for this. I myself was in, in uh, you know, initially in Arizona. Uh, there's a, a telescope which you know used to be a German American uh, a telescope. Now it sort of belongs to Arizona on its own. And then was in Spain. There's a 30 meter telescope uh, in, in the a Pico Veleta, it's just near Granada, uh, you know, sort of, you, you can almost see the Alhambra and you can see the, the oceans from the mountains and you can go skiing next, next door. It's a, <laughs> it's a wonderful telescope, it's a massive, uh, big telescope, um, which uh, usually looks for molecular lines, which looks for dust or for chemicals in, in the universe. Mm -hmm. And only when you combine it with all the other telescopes, it gets the resolution to, uh, uh, to see the um to see the event horizon yeah so all of these telescopes have their own personality i always say you know is uh, and that has you know gives gives problems also telescope is only human <laughs> uh after all right so <laughs> it's run by humans it has its own uh, quirks and 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 and, and problems and, and 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 properties 
uh, that need to be taken care of. Um, and then you have to make sure it all works. It, it works all in, in synchronization. And you put atomic clocks next to the telescopes to synchronize them. That's still not good enough mm -hmm. uh, because you need to then correct the atomic clocks by looking at actually um, uh, quasars and black holes in the universe, which actually act as reference points. And therefore, you can use them also as, as, as co to correct your, your, your clocks. Uh, um, you need to actually, in, in, when you bring the data together later, you need to take into account uh, aspects like, uh, well, the precise position. You need to be to, to a fraction of a millimeter. You need to sort of determine the position of the telescopes across the globe. Mm -hmm. um, in, in the initial models, people you know, measure and take into account continental drift. Uh, the tidal waves. I mean, the, the Earth's breezes. You know, it goes up and down. Uh, all this, these these things have been put into these models actually over the last decades. You know, we didn't invent this. We we make use of like 40 years or 50 years of of, of work on on VLBI that has come to a culmination really in, uh, in in this experiment. So I could go on and on. You know, yeah. talk about the polar wonder, right? The the, the Earth wobbles, <laughs> uh, and that's something you would see. Uh, in, in, in this real BI data, uh, like uh, you know, some of this you 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 can calculate sort of Jupiter pulling on on the Earth, so you know the Earth wobbles a little bit. But then there's a 10 meter or 20 meter wobble that's left, and that has to do with the you know, the ocean swapping around and the the air being on one side a bit more than on the others or, or whatever. So I mean, <laughs> the the Earth is pretty round, but you know, it, it, at a certain level, everything becomes an egg. <laughs> and and, and that's right. Um, so good. So we have another question. Are there observations ongoing? I know a lot was canceled due to COVID. What's the current status of observations? Yeah, good, good question. I mean, we had we were extremely lucky. 2017, we had uh, uh, our annus mirabilis, mirabilis uh, you know, a, a, a miracle year where everything worked. The weather was fine all around the world. All the telescopes worked um, and, and we got all the data we needed. Um, and uh, uh, by the way, I didn't answer the, the previous question. I have to come back to you know whether that was polarization was planned or not. And uh, in 2018, we tried again, and then you know some telescopes were weren't ready, some receivers were were not working. Um, we uh, we had bad weather. In fact, I was in Spain. You know, I couldn't see the top of the telescopes. It was so <laughs> foggy. We were middle in the middle of clouds, uh, and that was you know, we, we couldn't see even the brightest radio sources. We couldn't see anymore. In in, in 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 some days, wow. um, and then at one telescope, even you know one of the, the crew was actually uh, held at gunpoint, um, and we stopped the observations because it, it it looked it was too dangerous, in in that region, and and it was, uh, and the entire telescope was shut down actually for a year or two, uh, because of of, of security issues, uh, and then uh, 2020, uh, 2019, we were all <laughs> extremely worn out, and some telescopes weren't ready again for maintenance and other reasons and security issues, as I mentioned. And then we were hoping 2020, yeah, we're going to observe again. Well, you know, <laughs> Corona struck. And it was like, really, I mean, uh, the last telescope, you know, we, we dropped it two weeks before uh, the observing run. And, you know, it was clear there was a, it was a global lockdown and we couldn't do the observations anymore. But 2021 looks like it's going to happen yeah. in April. Oh, wow. So maybe we are lucky. Uh, we have more telescopes now. We have Greenland telescope. We have oh, nice. in France the Noema uh, array uh, by Iram. It's it's on the, in the French Alps, a two and a half thousand meter uh, altitude uh, plateau uh, in, in 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 the snow. It's a wonderful dish. It's very harsh conditions, but you know I've I've gone up there by helicopter. <laughs> I got a VIP treatment once by them. And uh, and you, you fly up there and you think it's like a James Bond movie because you know you're going up the Alps, nothing is there, and then suddenly out of this, you know, on this top of the mountain, you see, you know, these these eleven, you know, by now it should be twelve silver dishes, fifteen meter in diameter, with a with a big building in the center where you can actually entire dish can be moved into it, um, and, and and so it's it's bizarre, but it's, you know it's taking data for 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 I don't know twenty or thirty years now. I don't know how old it is now. It's uh, probably uh, in the late eighties it was built. Um, yeah, these are wonderful dishes, in, in, um, yeah. and each each one of them has it has their own stories and and, and people and yeah, usually wonderful places. Wow. And each yeah. of them has different food, right? So if yeah, you're in Spain, you right. get Andalusian food. If you go to France, you get French food. And if you go to Arizona, you get deep fried pizza. 
that you get from the supermarket. <laughs> well, you that. get nopales, yeah. Uh, and in uh, Greenland, you, what do you get? You get Danish food? What, what I haven't been there, I must say. Yeah, it's it's interesting because that's a it's 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 officially Danish territory, I think. Uh, yeah. But the, the Greenland people are you know still pretty independent, I think. Uh, and uh, the telescope is run by uh, uh, our colleagues from uh, 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 Taipei. Mm. So. Oh, wow. Oh, so it's really, truly international, even within each. <laughs> yeah. It's all. very so funny. Arizonans running in Greenland and Taipei. Um, so we were going to talk about polarization and the announcement that was made yesterday. And we'll take more questions. Reminder, I'm talking Heino Falka, who is one of the leaders and originators of the idea of looking for light shadows. Isn't that interesting? I always say what I do is interesting because I'm looking for uh, the exposure of gravitational waves on the cosmic microwave background radiation. So we're using waves of light to expose waves of gravity in sort of an old fashioned film camera metaphor. But you're actually looking for shadows of gravity that are deleting out light. It's sort of acting as a, as a, as a sink, as a vacuum cleaner for light. And that was one of your main, uh, or, or, you know, kind of inspiring ideas way back when, before you even got funding to do this project. So uh, talk about what is polarization. I, I, my, my audience, as you can already tell, is extremely astute. They know a great deal, but there are some non-experts out there. What is polarization of a radio wave, and why does that tell us anything of interest about black holes that we didn't know before? Yeah, um, well, polarization is something that we usually, you know, in, in our don't directly. Um, you may actually notice this if you go to, uh, if you have a polarized sunglasses or actually a 3D movie. Uh, they typically have polarized glasses, which, you know, switch on and off in, in, in some coordinated fashion. Um, and there's a hidden property of light that it has a direction of, uh, of oscillation. It's a light wave and it oscillates in a certain plane. It can oscillate, you know, from left to right, but it can also oscillate up and down. And uh, normal light from the sun is unpolarized. It, it oscillates, you know, the half of the light is going left, right, the other half is going up and down. Uh, and so that averages out. But if you shine light on, for example, glass, you know, it's, it's reflected off glass, then actually light gets a preferred direction. Uh, it, it, it will be polarized, only a certain, you know, uh, orientation of, uh, uh, of, of this uh, oscillation will be emitted. And the same happens if you actually produce radio emission. Uh, a very simple example, if you have an, 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 an antenna, just a little rod antenna, right? You have electrons going up and down and they produce electromagnetic waves. And the, the waves will be sort of polarized, you know, which is sort of determined by the direction of, of this antenna. Um, so you'd have to, one, if, if to get unpolarized radio emission to transmit, you'd have to have an antenna go up and one antenna go left to right, you know, we have a cross essentially, then you would get unpolarized radio emission. But if you have one antenna, it's only uh, one polarization that you pick up or that you transmit. And, uh, and, 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 you know, detectors can, you know, our eyes cannot see that. I think some animals can actually see polarization. Yeah, bees can. Uh, but, mm -hmm. and, but, uh, but we have to use, you know, radio telescopes, polarization filters to actually translate that for us. And, uh, and and so radio telescopes can do this. They can split the radio waves up into different polarizations. In fact, they always do. And so this was always in our data and was always planned. It was actually something we always had to take into account. Um, so the only problem, really, only problem, quote unquote, is just to uh, to calibrate it properly to make sure the outcome is right. And that mm -hmm. you know, from we had the data since twenty eighteen on our hard drives. Um, but you know, to actually reduce and calibrate it took uh, three years, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, understand everything. It's just you know because you need to understand every little detail and so forth. Um, so uh, that that is a hard part. And what does it tell us about black holes? Well, um, you um, also radio light will be polarized near black holes. And what is polarizing it? It's magnetic fields. And magnetic fields play a very important role in controlling the gas flow that's falling into a black hole. They can actually, uh, you know, they, they can be dragged along and just disappear in the black hole, or they can become so strong that they even halt 
uh, the, the, the plasma. They, they form sort of a Star Trek-like shield, right? Uh, um, a, 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 around the black hole, which could even pr protect gas from falling in. And they can be wound up and lead to plasma shooting out uh, uh, on, um, uh, along the rotation axis of, of the black hole. Uh, so black hole magnetic fields, you know, in, on Earth, you know, we use them to you know, for, for the compass and, and to measure, you know, direction of uh, where Columbus would would go, right? <laughs> so we usually don't use we don't see them as very strong effects. But around black holes, these magnetic fields really determine the dynamics and the entire drama playing around black holes, um, and they polarize the light in a certain direction typically in a direction perpendicular to the magnetic fields. And so the image that we published shows the polarization of light, you know, the, the direction where it, you know, uh, oscillates. And sort of the magnetic fields that where it comes from is roughly 90 degrees relative to those fine lines that you see in this, uh, in this image. But then there are also relativistic effects and so forth. So you know, the, the real image in the end is much more complicated how black holes look like. Um, nothing is simple around black hole. Nothing is simple. But uh, more or less, you know, if you see that polarization, you know, polarized light, you you roughly get a feeling where the black, where the black, uh, the, the the magnetic fields are and what they're doing. So yeah, one of the um, the properties of black holes are kind of like particles. Uh, they can have a, a lot of different characteristics, uh, but actually they're, you know, they're limited to a handful. We have uh, mass, charge, and spin, and black holes uh, can have similar properties, but almost no more, right? Isn't that the so-called uh, no-hair theorem of black hole, uh, that they're, they're really kind of fungible in a sense? They aren't, they're, they aren't that complex in, 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 a, in yeah. a deep sense. They're in in that sense, black holes... Are Black holes are the most boring, uh, uh, the, the most boring objects in space, right? So they have these two parameters, the spin and the mass, and that that, that tells you everything about it, right? Um, so, uh, but they, uh, they 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 look and they, they they don't have hair, as you say, right? So they're the black holes themselves do not have the magnetic fields, right? So you cannot thread magnetic fields through the event horizon, for example. Yeah, they go from the inside to the from the event horizon to the outside, like we have on Earth, right? We have a magnetic field that's generated inside. You know, in the poles, you have these poloidal magnetic fields and goes to the outer space and protects us as well, uh, and you know, and, and connects to the inside. That's not possible in black holes. So if you if if magnetic fields fall into it, the magnetic fields will be cut off, and uh, and cut off from the rest of uh, of, of the environment. Yet we see those magnetic fields uh, very close to the event horizon. That's anchored in the uh, in the plasma. That's rotating around. It's being amplified. So while black holes cannot have hair, they can have a wick. You know, I I, I, I like to say, mm -hmm. and so they're really you know surrounded by this you know hair of magnetic fields, but it doesn't go inside. And that's uh, I think an important thing to understand. What can we learn more? I've had on Lenny Suskin and Sir Roger Penrose and others, and. Um, in Roger Penrose's case, he talks about the singularity as sort of the most interesting aspect of a black hole. Uh, Lenny Suskin, on the other hand, will say, no, it's the what he calls the stretched horizon. Uh, he, it's sort of above the event horizon by uh, a Planck length or something like that. Uh, what is the most interesting aspect of a black hole and what to you personally? And then what kind of future properties of light? We've, this, we've seen that the light has a spectrum. We know it has polarization. We know it has isotropy or patterns um, thereof. Are there any other properties that have yet to be discovered? Um, uh, we've seen time variability. You've made you know, what? What would be the next? Not the next major discovery. Although I hope that you'll clue me in next time. There's a big discovery. I'll keep it confidential. I promise. Uh, but uh, but are there other properties of light or radio waves that can be exploited? Uh, not speaking specifically, but can there other discoveries be made using the capabilities of technology? Uh, that was a good try to getting some confidential information out. <laughs> but uh, um, now let me start with the last question before I go back to the, I think, more fundamental question you raised at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, what actually is, what, what makes black holes so interesting? Uh, certainly one of the, the important and maybe long-term goals really is to see whether black holes are spinning. And, uh, and that can produce a very interesting effect in combination with magnetic fields. Mm -hmm. In fact, the 
the, 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 black, the spin of black holes will make the space around black holes also co-rotate. And you know, magnetic fields are in that space and they'll be drawn along. And this way you can actually transport energy, uh, uh, transport rotationally energy from the black hole to the environment. You can actually you know, slow down the rotation of a black hole through magnetic fields that are threading around it and put it into a powerful plasma outflow. Hmm. And we, we, we are, you know, we, we think that's what's happening really what, in M87, uh, at least in our simulations, when we try to explain what we're seeing, uh, the effect that gives at least some fraction, some significant fraction of the energy to this outflow is actually spin energy from the black hole. Uh, that's not, not the entire story, but that, that certainly is an important effect. And, and this is a very fundamental effect that, you know, was also, I think, uh, also by Roger Penrose was the first one to describe a process with light, where you can shine light on a black hole. It can actually extract uh, spin energy from a black hole by you know, scattering light uh, in a different way, left or right, around a spinning black hole. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a very fundamental thing, you know, really, you know, isn't that cool, right? You, you extract energy from a black hole. I mean, this is yeah, mighty, you know. Right. Yeah, Jan 11. A mighty battery. You just tap into it and, and you get uh, you know, a huge amount of energy out. <laughs> and that's what, what these supermassive black holes do. Um, and on, in, the, in the very long run, yes, of course, it's, it's, it's this big question. What's really happening at the event horizon? What's happening with information? What's happening really early? And... In, 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 um, Indeed, it's, it remains a fundamental question. You know, maybe the, the, the event horizon is totally boring. You know, at least in relativity, when you fall through the event horizon, you know, nothing really exciting happens. Um, you know, it's just you, you wouldn't even notice really uh, anything happening to you. And even like a supermassive black hole like M87, you could fall through it. You would be, you wouldn't even be ripped into pieces because it's <laughs> you know it's so big. Tidal forces are not so strong. You know, you are so small compared to. Uh, that big, big black hole. But, you know, what's happening in the singularity? And the annoying and, and almost, um, yeah, the, the, this, this, uh, yeah, this mightily annoying aspect is that we, we, we can't know, right? So because, the event, because this event arises, we can't look into it. There's some ex extremely exciting physics where time is reversed, where all the matter is to turn into something that we have no clue of what it is, right? How can you have six billion solar masses in, in disappearing in something that is you know, in, in almost infinitely small? Mm -hmm. What's happening there? Um, some extremely weird physics that's beyond our, our understanding and we can't measure it. <laughs> that's so, it's like, you know, I always compare this to uh, like, like Christmas time, right? So uh, you have, you know, at least, you know, in, in the old days, my, my parents would, you know, you would all the presents would be in, in the room and then the door would be shut, right? I would not be allowed to go in. And you could peek through the, the, the keyhole a little bit and try to figure out what, what's going on. There's this Christmas tree and all these presents around and so forth. Um, but you know, you know, next day, tomorrow, you, you know, or we celebrate in the evening, you can go in and, and you know, and, and look what's in there. Right. And, and right now it's looked like, you know, the universe and God tells us, right? So, you know, there's this wonderful physics inside but you know this door i'll keep shut right you know just you know go off <laughs> you can look through the keyhole but you know you're, you're going to see anything uh, and that that makes it so um so dramatic for physics you know right. we, we're, we're rattling on this door we try to get in we, we try to understand what's happening inside black holes we can dream about it we can uh we can have many theories there, there's so many ideas and theories uh you know from penrose to ziskerns but many others um, but how are we going to test it? And this, I think, is, is, is sort of a, you know, the, the big battle that we are going to fight in the next, uh, I don't know, years, 10 years, decades, 100 years, 1,000 years. I have no clue whether and when we will solve that. Right. No. And that's uh, that makes, makes it so interesting. Um, yeah. But I want to go as far as possible. That's why I wanted to go to this, this edge of black holes. Maybe you'll go journey someday into the black hole with uh with elon musk uh and spacex so we're talking today again well, I, 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 i'm happy to let him go i you know i'm <laughs> i'm 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 ready to you know i'm i'm willing to stay behind and that's you know, right you'll enjoy uh, this earth this right. planet well someone's got to host the press conference at home uh so we're talking again with Heino falca one of the leaders of the event horizon telescope you can find him on twitter h falca 
And uh, you can find our Event Horizon Telescope. I'm showing some images here on uh, YouTube. Please do subscribe to this pod podcast wherever you're listening to it or watching it. Just hit the hit the subscription little bell there or whatever it is, uh, wherever you may be getting this. And on Clubhouse, we are going to take questions in a few minutes as well. We've been taking some on uh, YouTube and Facebook. We're on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter Periscope as we speak. So we got all the technology here. We're using it all, Heine. Uh, make it good. I want to also point out that, that the Heino's book is coming out in the U.S. at least in May. I think it's already out some parts of the universe, right? Yeah, it's a, it was already out in German. I, you know, it was easier for me to write it in German. Uh, then it got to the Netherlands and then uh, in Spain it's out now and now it's coming to the U.S. at uh, May the 4th. May the 4th be with you. Can't wait. Uh, it's a wisely chosen uh, date, Star Wars Day. Um, and then you can, you know, read the entire story of the Event Horizon Telescope uh, from, uh, in fact, the first first view of a little child, you know, is inspired by the moon landing to uh, the first view uh, together with, with students and colleagues uh, of, of this entirely new world, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the exciting region around black holes. Yeah, it's, it's an amazing movie. journey from, you know, the really the, you know, the, the the first astronomers looking at the stars to, to us now looking into black holes. We've come a long way, really. Yeah, we um, certainly have. And uh, even in just the last couple of weeks, it's been the news won't stop. Yesterday or two days ago, I had on James Beecham uh, and Phil Ilton of uh, the Large Hadron Collider and the ATLAS experiment and the LHC B beauty experiment uh, that detected potential evidence for a fifth force of nature uh, new materials, new matter, new violations of fundamental symmetries. Uh, this announcement came the day after uh, by your team and uh, your collaborators. Uh, you know, who knows what's going to come next? A couple weeks ago, similarly, there's been just you know, a, a spectacular news coming out of all quadrants of astronomy and physics. And it's just an amazing time. We landed a, a helicopter on Mars. Uh, we're going to have an airfield on another planet, which actually has a piece of the right flyer you know, this little fabric uh, segment of the original Flyer 1 that the Wright brothers flew from Kitty Hawk, and now it's on Mars, and they set up nice. an airport there. Yeah. So there's going to be TSA delays, I'm sure. Uh, but stay tuned for more great uh, events on this channel. We have David Spurgel coming up, John Mather, uh, and many other uh, great guests coming up, uh, as, uh, as well as uh, Professor Sarah Seeger, uh, who made a big announcement herself last year of a potential evidence for phosphine which is a byproduct we think of life she's a guest that will be on very soon as well so i know uh in the a few minutes we have left we do have more questions and i want to uh bring those up so um why were black how can black holes survive potentially uh these these collisions and explosions and and sort of uh e events that would ordinary tear ordinary matter apart what what actually is the force that makes black holes so resilient against the most cataclysmic forces in nature? Yeah, and and, and it is gravity, and that that's really amazing aspect. That gravity is really the weakest of all forces, uh, and and it keeps us on the planet, but it doesn't destroy us. But if you really, you know, if, if everything pulls together in one direction, then gravity wins over all forces in nature. And that's because there is no anti-gravity, right? So in electrons and protons or, you know, in charges, you have po uh, positive and negative charges in magnetic fields or north and south pole. Gravity, you only have gravity. And, and that, that makes it very special. It all, and if you think about it, gravity is actually that made our world, right? You had this big bang, uh, but then it was due to gravity that everything came together and assembled. And, uh, and, and you formed an earth and, uh, and planets and sun and stars. And it's, uh, so yeah, it's gravity that, that, that gives us life in, the, <laughs> in, 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 in this universe. And, and yeah, it, when it all, you know, it, when it, it runs away, when gravity becomes stronger than anything else, it, it collapses, it forms a black hole. And then there really is nothing there to, 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 um, to escape its, its grip. Yeah. And that is uh, very, uh, yeah, it's very fundamental and, and strange uh, mm -hmm. property of gravity. And, uh, and indeed, the last thing that will survive probably in this universe are really supermassive black holes. 
Yeah. I mean, the M87 will live a, I mean, if, even if, if there's Hawking radiation, M87 will live a staggering 10 to the 97 years. So it's mm -hmm. one with 97 zeros. You know, I, you know, in this book, I tried to calculate, you know, I, th I thought I'd try to explain this somehow in, in a way that we can comprehend. Uh, it was impossible. It was like, you know, I, if, you know, over the lifetime of the universe, you take one proton, one atom out of this universe. Okay. Every age of the universe. Yeah. Yeah. And you keep doing this. The universe will be gone faster than this black hole will have disappeared. Mm, yeah, yeah it's, it's just uh, one atom <laughs> this, you know, gazillions of, of 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 protons and atoms in this entire universe and that's still, right you know people want to talk about you know a supernova that's brighter than the whole galaxy that it lives within but uh but these black holes have have a permanence that uh hollywood celebrities can only dream about ernesto is asking absolutely. again that is entropy not an, you said that there's only these two properties of black holes but he's asking isn't entropy a, uh, a property related to temperature of the black hole that's an, another distinguishing feature. Uh, well, this, this is sort of a something that came out of you know, the, sort of the aspect of quantum gravity, and uh, and you can, but in the end, these these properties of black holes, you know, entropy or or, or temperature, are directly related to the mass. Yeah, mm. so it's it's just a different word word for the mass of a black hole. Right. Ali is asking, apologies if this came up. I don't think it did. But why do you think that uh, there is a supermassive black hole at the center of almost all galaxies? What is, what is the <clears throat> reason behind that? Is it coincidence? Is it, do they form? Are they the reason that galaxies form? What is our best knowledge about that? Yeah, yeah stuff got to go somewhere, right? So, <laughs> and, and if you look at the evolution of a, a cluster of, of stars, uh, you know, you have this, this distribution of stars. Some of them will turn into black holes. They will sink towards the center. They, you know, the, and the, the heaviest objects typically sink towards the center. And, and then there's no way to go. At some point, they have to co coalesce into one bigger black hole. And then more and more will come. And it will keep growing. And since a black hole doesn't really evaporate fast enough, enough on any, any galactic time scales, it will just get bigger. And so it's almost unavoidable that you have supermassive black holes at the very center, unless they're kicked out. But you know who's who's ready to you know to bully a supermassive black hole out of a galaxy? I mean, this is, <laughs> it, you know, it, it only can be another black hole, more or right. less. <clears throat> Thor is not going to make it all the way out there. Um, uh, so, and then the next question is more of a host prerogative question. As the host of the Into the Impossible podcast, please do subscribe and leave a comment if you're enjoying this. And if you're new to the channel, yeah, leave a. Leave me, give me a thumbs up uh, uh, in the in the little uh, icons there. Um, so what's next for our galaxy? We saw last year Andrea Ghez um, and uh, Reinhard Gensel won Nobel Prizes for the work that they did to image the um, the motion and the dynamics of stars near the, uh, it just said compact object at the center of our galaxy. It didn't say supermassive black hole. Uh, exactly. Yeah. What is the uh, prospects for event horizon? Is there is there something that precludes the event horizon telescope from seeing it? Is it easier to see M eighty seven because it's sort of uh, more more massive? What what are the pros and cons of Sag A star versus M eighty seven, for example? Yeah, we should be able to see it, right? So eventually, I'm I'm absolutely convinced. That's what got me going in initially. That's what we wanted to see, and M eighty seven was sort of a lucky shot. To some degree, right? So, it, mm -hmm. it, and it turned out to be a very good lucky shot because it's, it's a big one. It's, it's, uh, and so all the the gas that rotates around takes actually, you know, days to weeks, like three weeks to go around. So if you take a, a picture within a day, it's actually relatively stable. Uh, in the galactic center, stuff goes around in in twenty minutes or so. Uh, so within a day, it has it has made many many rotations. And so that makes it really hard to uh, to image. Mm. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, then you're integrating over longer time scales, so that actually is better. So we are, you know, we we, we are we are more um, sensitive to the space time, which is stable, over uh, and much less affected by the variability of, of the plasma, which you know can move the shadow a little bit around and, and, and makes intensity brighter left or right sometimes. Uh, so in the long run, uh, such a star, the center of our galaxy will be the prime target, the one that is really most important. And we, we have yet to see the event horizon and the shadow in this one.
But thanks to the work of, of Gensel and Gaze, we know exactly how heavy it is. You know, it's less than a percent. It's a fraction of a percent. We know the mass. We know the mass of this black hole better than our own mass, right? Our own weight. Um, and, and, and so by, you know, we know exactly how big the shadow should be because that's related to the mass. Um, and this is something we, we should test. We will test. We will, we will see eventually. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we may need a few more uh, uh, telescopes in the long run to do it a little bit better. We may want to go into space uh eventually but yes we will see it we will see the shadow i'm i'm pretty convinced and uh I, of course I, it would be nice if it would be not exactly as we expect it to be but uh you know we have to <laughs> we have to wait and see and look right. what the data tells us and i assume i'll be the second to know this time, next time I'm on that day. that's only fair you know after after all i've been through um, i want to ask you about future prospects uh if you had your choice would you rather have a another baseline, say, uh, on another planet, maybe Mars is nice this time of year. Would you rather have, um, you know, higher frequency? Would you like to do optical? I mean, could you use an optical interferometry on a planetary scale to get even better measurements of the uh, event horizon, maybe even closer in, zoom in? Or is this basically at the limits of what we'll ever know about the, you know, kind of shape, configuration, magnetic field of black holes? We're astronomers, you know, we want it all. Right, so yeah, we 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 want all of this, all of the above. Um, but yes, I mean, we first start with more baselines on Earth to give slightly more robust uh, measurements. Uh, we're really at the limit of uh, what we can do at, at the moment with these few telescopes. As I said, you know, we're I'm involved in a in, in a project. We're trying to get the telescope into a you know, continent is missing uh, at this moment. Uh, and then eventually you go to space. Uh, and you want to go to higher frequencies as well. You know, the higher the frequency, the longer the separation of the telescopes, the better the image. Now, going to Mars is probably, you know, initially a bit far away um, to, to do it because you really, you know, it's overkill. You're really uh, having too much resolution, actually. You don't want to do that. Uh, and if you want to see things that are so small that you have to put a telescope on Mars, it has to be insanely big mm. because, you know, they'll be weak typically and, uh, uh, and so. Um, and it takes a long time for Mars to rotate around uh, the sun uh, and Earth. So you, because that's what we, we, we're using the Earth to look at it from different directions, right? The Earth rotates and we, we, we're using that effect. So, you know, somewhere in space between, you know, a medium Earth orbit to, uh, you know, people talk about even the moon. I, I think that that probably is already a bit too far away. Um, mm. But uh, but really, you know, we, we, we've done a study, you know, what we call the event horizon imager. If you put three dishes, don't even have to be very big around Earth at 15,000 kilometer altitude from the center. Uh, you get almost perfect, perfect images. Uh, sharp images, you know, nothing, you know, not this donut anymore. You see wisps of the black hole and so forth. So it's, it's sci-fi can become reality. It's a question of will and, and of money, of course. Uh -huh. So Nico's asking, do you have any hopes for the Nobel Prize in 2021? I am not going to talk about that. I assume they no. mean me, not you. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah, 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 it, yeah, yeah, right. It wouldn't so, be out of no. the question. Look how many uh, Nobel Prizes have gone to black holes in just the last three years. It's in incredible. Um, so uh, I mean, I think what really qualifies me uh, for the Nobel Prize is I've appeared on your show, I guess. So that's uh, that, <laughs> that might sense. disqualify you, Heine. You, you don't know. I mean, you might know my book uh, uh, about yeah, losing right. it, but, um, but I, I know, I, I know. You. Yeah. Um, so last question I have uh, from uh, from myself, and then I'll open it up on Clubhouse, on a couple more on YouTube, is um, if it, are we at the same you know precipice as you know, for example, LIGO? Once once LIGO really made convincing discoveries now it's turned into you know it has hundreds of discoveries it has it's become statistically significant not just one-off mesmerizing discovery so i analogize their discovery in 2015 2016 with your 2019 discovery when will you get into the kind of just you know discovery a day or imaging a day or will that never happen based on you know how exquisitely precise these images have to be and how much time that takes. Will you ever get to the yeah. level of statistical measurements, black hole event horizons every day? Yeah, good point. That, that I mean, that's what I said before, the, the gravitational wave, they have many, many sources. 
but they're, they're gone very quickly. We only have at this point two sources. All the other ones are too far away or too small. All the Earth is too small, right? So <laughs> however you like it. On the other hand, it's, it's amazing that the Earth is just big enough, right? So it's just big yeah, enough. Right. Um, and you, you know, normally you could go to higher frequencies and you become more precise. But if you go to the uh, like ter terahertz regime, higher frequency radios, the atmosphere actually shuts off. Mm. So we're really, really at the edge of what you can do from the ground. Um, but we can do it well. We can do it better. Uh, and and uh, and I think we have. Like, we want to do a movie. We can do a movie from 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 the ground. Yeah. But it, it will remain hard work. It's not that we get just bang, 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 many images. Each of these images will be, I think, a masterpiece and, and valuable in itself, but it will inc involve a lot of hard work. And if you want to see, you know, dozens and thousands of black holes, you have to go to, to the space mission. Mm. Uh, and that, that will take a while. So um, I think every result, every paper that we publish will remain precious for the next couple of years. Yeah, every every source, every paper, just like every person uh, is precious on the team, no doubt. I know it's been such a pleasure. I've started to read your book. You were kind enough to send me an advanced copy in in English. I requested a German copy. Uh, I don't know. I must have gotten. Oh, you did? Comment. No, I'm just kidding. I, I, okay, I good. I only know one word in German. Is it true that the word? What is the word for ambulance in German? Krankenwagen. Krankenwagen. Yes, that's my favorite yeah. word in all of okay. German. <laughs> Call a Krankewagen for the for Keating. Um, I want to thank you for your time and congratulate you and your team on success. As we said at the very beginning, uh, the team and dynamics and human uh, enterprise that is science. We are always thought of scientists as walking Wikipedia's or something, but but actually the hardest part is to realize we're all human beings and to coordinate this is really a testimony to you and your team. And I wish you great luck with it. And I want to have you back later this spring. Once your book is out and available in America, at least, um, and we'll, uh, I'm already really tearing through it, enjoying it. I know we're kindred spirits. I'd like to talk to you uh, in great depth. Uh, but for now, it's late there. You have plans uh, for a celebration dinner. I don't want to keep you from that. And we're going to sign off. So please, yes, everybody do uh, look into Heino's book. You can get it on Amazon already. There's a link in the YouTube description. While you're on YouTube, subscribe to the channel. We have, as I said, David Spurgle coming up very soon. You'll be surprised how soon he comes out. Uh, Sarah Seeger and John Mather, just to name a few. And you can find past videos, Sir Roger Penrose, Frank Wilczek, as well as with, uh, as with Jan Eleven and Katie Freeze and all these great black hole aficionados. Do not miss it. Hey, no, thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. Thank you for going into the impossible. Part one, part two to come. Have a great rest of your day. Okay, that's great. Yeah, have, a, have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody. And it's a very small gathering tonight, right, because of Corona. It's just, you know. <laughs> well, we had over 250 people watching currently. So it's a, we, had, we, we, we have a very large gathering to uh, wish you congratulations.